Good day. Welcome to On His Authority, a channel dedicated to gospel preaching, teaching, and singing. Today, I kind of want to look a little bit at a topic called God Is. So as we know, God is defined by His attributes. We say things like omnipotent, omnipresent, loving, gracious, etc. Uh, these are great because they define God as He has revealed Himself to us, but also remember that we don't know the full extent of God. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God. He does not reveal the full extent of himself. Now, that's possibly and probably because humanity could not contain the full knowledge of the Most High, but God does reveal himself to us in ways that we can digest for the full extent of our human lives. What he has revealed in his word gives us enough material to search the depths of him and never reach the bottom. And then in eternity, we can search the depths of him in person and never reach it because he is infinite. That, that's one of the joys of being with God for eternity, is that we can search him forever and we never find the end. But today, let's focus on what's revealed right now. So another way, besides attributes, that God has revealed himself is through his titles. So the Bible gives many titles to God. Some of the cool ones, Holy One, Ancient of Days. That's my favorite. The most common title given is Lord. We're going to explore in point two one aspect of that, but not the full meaning of a term. That's a, that's a whole sermon in and of itself. So I don't want to explore these titles, but I want to narrow it down to three titles who, uh, the, who reveals who God is. So as a side note, we're not going to explore the names of God. That's a big task for another time. We're just going to look at three titles that talk about how he is in relation to us. So in how he relates to, to mankind, I want to talk about three things that God is Father, God is Master, and God is God. First, God is Father. Look at Matthew 6, 9. It says, After this manner pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So Jesus himself refers to God with the title of Father. So God is sometimes called Father in the Old Testament, but more commonly he's referred to as the husband of Israel. And Israel, of course, we know plays the harlot. When Jesus comes along and begins to teach of God as Father, it's borderline revolutionary. Because, of course, if people had been invested in the entirety of the Old Testament, the concept would not have been so strange to them. Humanity is familiar with the role that the Father plays. There are three traits of a Father that I want to look at that reveal our relationship between God and us. First of all, is God is relational. Proverbs 17, 6, children's children are crowned to old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. A child who has a father is blessed indeed. Children desire their fathers. So right now, in this modern day, we live out the results of third wave feminism, which the family puts so much emphasis on the mother now that it's borderline deemed that a father is unnecessary. But anyone that lives in reality actually knows that life without a father is extremely, extremely difficult. Children behave differently around their fathers than they do their mothers. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's just a fact. And children who have a relationship with their fathers thrive from this. This is us with God. So we're called the sons of God. God does not leave us to our own devices. God is not distant to us. God has a relationship with us as a father and a son. With God, we get to communicate. So listen, if you feel distant from God, it's not him. He's an ever-present help, he says. 
God seeks a relationship with his creation. He is relational. Also, look at Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. God is protective. Under that role of father, he is protective. A good father protects his children. So anyone with children knows the pains of when your child gets hurt. And then as they grow older, they have to make choices and they have to learn from their mistakes. And as a parent, you seek to protect them from all physical and emotional harm. God, as the perfect example of fatherhood, protects those who are his. If an earthly father seeks to guard his children, how much more so will God guard his? In Deuteronomy 31.6 that I just read to you, Moses is about to die. He's giving his last words to the Israelites. And then in this verse, he's assuring them that though he's, he's going to be dead, God does not break his promises. Joshua will lead them to the promised land. There's going to be battle there. There's going to be hardships there. But God has said to them, do not be afraid. He doesn't fail. He does not forsake. He is the perfect father who is always there for his child. But God is a father also. He chastises. Hebrews 12.8 but if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you're bastards and not sons. So this, this is where it gets difficult. Up till now, it's wonderful. This is where it gets difficult. An unfortunate truth is that children get out of line. The children of Israel got so out of line, it took them 40 years to complete around a two-week journey out of Egypt. Unfortunately, part of being a father is playing the part of disciplinarian. Men can take this too far in their sinfulness, but God is perfect in his discipline. God is the perfect disciplinarian. We, as his children, will get out of line as well, and it's his duty, his responsibility, to correct us. As a father and a moral citizen, you will spend time and effort being amiable with your neighbors and building relationships with your friends and family. This is called making a good name for yourself. You would be a fool to let your young children run roughshod over everything you've spent so much time to build. This is called ruining your name. God will not tolerate Christians ruining his name. But you may say to me, they're charlatans all over TBN using God's name. They rob widows and they use his name to turn a prophet. Listen, Christian, this is where we can take comfort in our own chastisement. God doesn't chasten someone else's children. If you do not receive the chastisement of God, then you're an illegitimate child. But God graciously teaches and instructs his children as a good father should. God is Father. Look at Jude 1 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. That's where I want to stop. God is Master. James, Jude, and Paul all refer to themselves by a very particular term. The King James Version translates that as servant. The NASB and the New King James kind of get that a little bit more accurate as bond servant. The Greek word for this term is doulos. And that literally means one that's in bondage to another, a slave. So each one of these titans of early Christianity refer to themselves as a lowly slave in the service of their master, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. God himself is referred to as that master of which they are in bondage. 
The Bible speaks of men as sons of God, but it also speaks using the allegory of the relationship of master and slave. So this is an immense stumbling block to the American mindset as, honestly, we have a terrible history with the practice. But this was considered, I want to tell you this, also immensely foolish to the Greeks at the time of the writing of the Bible because they valued freedom above all else. So, so, so I want to handle this topic with care but also, I want to argue that surrendering, surrendering your freedom to God makes you more free than you've ever been. So let's look at the practice of first century Roman slavery. Yeah, sounds like a great time. And view why this is comforting to the Christians. So three, three points on God being master. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are gods. So the first thing that a first century slave owner had to do is first he had to purchase his slaves. So of course he did this through the markets. Slaves in first century Rome would be captured enemies, criminals, sometimes even other Romans. Ultimately, in this day, Romans did not care about skin color, but they determined their opinion of you based on your citizen citizenship status. They conquered so many lands and they would pick up what they liked, leave what they didn't, but they didn't care about your, for lack of a better term, race. They cared about were you Roman. And if you were Roman, then you're golden. But if you were anything else, you were basically considered dirt to be conquered. Well, the good news is that God looks favorably on the dirt. Romans paid with money. God paid with the blood of his son. We're not bought with worldly currency like Simon the sorcerer tried to do, but God spared not his own son to demonstrate love toward us and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Using the currency of his own blood, the sin debt was paid totally in full. God purchased unbelievers through the precious blood of Christ. Look at John 8, 33 and 34. Not only does God has God purchased us, but he is the commander of the one who has the authority to issue commands. They answered him. This is the Jews answering Jesus. We are Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How say you, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. The Jews hated Jesus for the words that he taught them. Here, at this section, they, they claim that they are free men because they're Abraham's descendants. This is foolishness. The Jews had a brief time of freedom under the judges and a handful of kings, but then they were conquered by Assyria, then Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Alexander the Great's Greek Empire, and then after that, Rome. The seed of Abraham had not been what we would consider free for over 500 years. And Israel, again, won't be a country self-ruled until 1948. That means it goes almost two millennia without being free. Yet, they say, we are children of Abraham and slaves to no man. They're wrong. Jesus corrects them. So the master has the authority to command a slave what to do. So Jesus says to them that they're, they're, they're going to be a slave to a master. Either him or sin. So sin's commands are easier to follow, for they seemingly fall in line with what the flesh craves. Sin will command you to do things that 
seem to satisfy the cravings that you feel. Sin, get this, even pays you wages. But those wages are death. Sin as a master will always, always, always take you farther than you want to go. God gives this warning as early as Genesis 4 when he tells Cain that sin crouches at the door and desires you. And Cain, you must master it. You have to overcome it because sin is hiding there and it wants to get you. Sin will whisper sweet lies to you, but that's exactly what they are. They're lies. God, on the other hand, he's a good master. He's the embodiment of a good commander. I'm not going to list a full list of commands as commands are spread throughout the entire Bible. It's not just the Ten Commandments. It's all in the old. It's all in the new. Read the whole thing. It'll be good for you. But each one is good for mankind, both for living and for spiritual well-being. Sin looks after the body, but it can't satisfy the spirit. God nurtures both body and spirit. Sin may pay wages, but God gives gifts. The gift of Romans 6.23 is eternal life. God will command you to do his will, but if he has bought you, then your will is going to be in line with his will. You're not going to be a reluctant servant. You're going to want what he wants because he's changed your heart. Not only is God bought you and commander over you, but God, as your master, must provide for you. Look at Psalm 50:10. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Speaking of his richness, in an agricultural society, cattle on a thousand hills means you're loaded. In first century Rome, there was one big difference between the average free man and the slave. The free man would be a day laborer, working to make a day's wages. He would use this to purchase food, clothing, shelter for his family, home. If there was no work, then the free man did not eat. He did not pay for his home. He did not clothe his family. The slave, on the other hand, had to be provided for. The master must provide him food, clothing, and shelter. He can't go out and get a job. He works for the master. He can't provide this stuff for himself. The master has to. He must have a place for the slave's family to rest. Slaves had families then. He must feed him to keep him strong. He must train him in the job he wishes for him to do. The free man has his freedom, but the slave is completely and totally provided for. Get what, get what I'm saying here? Now, now, I'll give you this. There were poor slave owners who mistreated their slaves. There were rich ones that mistreated their slaves. This is a fact all throughout history. Men are fallen. We understand this. And, and honestly, the mistreatment is a major factoring in the abolishing of it in the modern world. People couldn't, couldn't handle it. But there were also kind masters who actually treated their men as human beings. In the Old Testament, when a master was kind to his slave and the slave wished to continue serving him, he would pierce his ear and the man would serve him forever. In Deuteronomy, it talks about him loving him. If there were human masters who were good enough to work for that you're going to let them drive a nail through your earlobe, how much more so is it pleasing to work for God? Calling God master is not a burden. We say all the time that we, we seek his will for our lives. That's a slave asking his master what tasks there are to do. God is the good master, 
provides for us all that we need so that we may serve Him. Not only that, Isaiah 40, 28, God is Master, God is Father, God is God. Isaiah 40, 28, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. One thing that we forget when we're serving God is that he is God. He reveals himself to us through names, attributes, and titles, but ultimately he's not human. God is a spirit, and we worship him in spirit and in truth. God is alien to humanity. Now, don't be going and saying, hey, the preacher told me God's an alien. God is not an alien. God is alien to mortality. Aside from Jesus, who experienced mortality for us. So, whereas we are bound to mortality and time, God is not held to these limitations. God can look upon time as if it's a book. Open it up. Look in the middle pages. Look at the front. Look at the back. Time is nothing to him. God is not like the gods of mythology. Zeus is basically just a man with superpowers. Odin may control the world, but he's basically an immortal man with mortal problems. God is beyond this. Let's look at three things that talk about God being God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God's a creator. The first time we meet God in the scriptures is as a creator. He has the power and authority to speak something out of nothing. Humanity is just a pale reflection of its creator. Listen, humans love to create art, architecture, literature, families, relationships. Men are most at home when they're creating. We have this innate desire to do what our maker did. And mankind has created some impressive things. But listen, all pale in comparison to what God has created, and he did not do it of the labor of his brow, but with a spoken word. In all of creation, God describes it one way. Good. It's good. God creates and sees that it's good. The ocean, good. The mountain, good. The land, good. The creatures, everything is good. The only time in creation that God says something is not good is when he looks down and sees the loneliness of man. That's not good. And if you've ever been lonely, then you'll agree with him. How does God solve the problem of man's loneliness? Through the art of creation. Creates Eve to be a helpmeet for Adam. Not only is God a creator, he's a sustainer. Job 26, 7. He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. Not only has God created all things, he sustains all things. Here we see that the, he hangs the earth on absolutely nothing. Earth is held in suspension by the power of God. Now, of course, the skeptics among us are going to argue it's gravity. Gravity keeps the planets rotating. But let me ask you this. Where does the gravity come from? Where does whatever powers gravity come from? And what controls that and that and that? God holds it together. God sustains the heavenly bodies just as he sustains every creature on earth. He clothes the lilies of the field. He feeds the birds, and he's not surprised when they fall. He sets up kings, and he takes down kings. He watches over each and every person. He personally plants each child in the womb of his mother. He uses nations as pawns for his judgment and purposes. The very elements have to obey his will. We have a term for this. We call it sovereignty. God is 
sovereign over all. He's the king that dwells over the lands. He's the president over the countries. He's the lord over the peasants. To put this plainly, he's the one true God over the entirety of the universe. And all is upheld by the word of his power. Not only is God those, look at Psalm 76, 7. God is to be feared. Thou, even thou, art to be feared. And who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry? We tend to water down God's power because it truly is incomprehensible to us. We like the God of peace, peace, patience, and love. So we neglect the God of anger, holiness, and judgment. God is so much more. He's so much deeper than just a bro that loves us the way we are. And he tolerates it because he just loves you so much. God loves with a perfect love which tears through the human heart and seeks to destroy all sin that dwells there. You cannot be of sin and be of God. The fact of the matter is, first John there makes that plain. The fact of the matter is, is that God is scary. Listen, Christian, that's okay. The very beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. If you were to be a wise Christian, which we all should be, there's no excuse for us not to be, that's the baby step. That's the very first baby step to fear Him. Start by understanding how far He is above you and how low you are in power to Him. This does not mean that we live our lives in fear. Like a Greek sailor hoping that Poseidon's calm that day. We're not called to a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and discipline. As you grow in your Christian walk, your fear of God becomes more reverential. Just as a child fears their father, but also basks in the love of him, we have the same way with God. Just as the slave of a good master fears the one that owns him, he also respects him, for he knows that he seeks the good of both the master and the slave. God is for God, and that should be comforting for you. What God wants is perfect, and we get to reap the benefits of it. Fear God, for this is where wisdom begins. In conclusion, God is infinite. We spend our whole lives searching His depths and we don't find Him. Then we enter into eternity and we get to search Him forever. The great thing about Him is that it's not a chore, but it's a glory that we get to do this. You may notice that nowhere in here did I talk about 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. I didn't use that. But I hope that in looking at these three titles of God, that you did see that love is intertwined through each one. Man-made deities always fall short in one way or another. Because at their core, they're just a man-made creation. God, on the other hand, never falls short. And He never fails. Let's live for Him. Not thinking of him as a man, but revering him as God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I love you. And I thank you for giving us another day. Lord, this year has been quite a lot. But Father, you're in control. You're God. Your very hands hold the earth. But Lord, your hands also hold our hearts. God, be with us as we go on. I pray you'd give us comfort and strength. Comfort the one that's hurting. Uplift the one that's scared. God, your people need you. We cry out wondering how long, 
how long? Help us, God. In the days of persecution, God, give us a thick backbone that we can stand up for you. I love you, Father. I praise you for who you are. You're God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen.